Chapter Four, A Day with Byron. One February afternoon in the year 1822, about two o'clock, for this is the hour at which his day begins, the most notorious personality of his century arouses himself in the Palazzo Lanfranchi in Pisa. George Gordon Noel, Lord Byron, languidly arises and dresses, with the assistance of his devoted valet, Fletcher. Invariably, he awakens in very low spirits, in actual despair and despondency, he has termed it. This is in part constitutional, and partly, no doubt, a reaction after the feverish brain work of the previous night. It is, at any rate, in unutterable melancholy and ennui that he surveys in the mirror that slight and graceful form which had been idolized by London drawing rooms, and the pale, scornful, beautiful face, like a spirit, good or evil, which the enthusiastic Walter Scott has termed a thing to dream of. He notes the grey streaks already visible among the brown locks, and mutters his own lines miserably to himself through life's dull road so dim and dirty i have dragged to three and thirty what have these years left to me nothing except thirty-three an innumerable motley crowd of reminiscences most of them bitter sorrowful or contemptuous throng across his mind shaping themselves into poignant verse there's not a joy the world can give like that it takes away when glow of earthly thought declines in feeling's dull decay tis not on youth's smooth cheek that blush alone which fades so fast but the tender bloom of heart is gone, ere youth itself be past. Oh, could I feel as I have felt, or be what I have been, or weep as I could have wept o'er many a vanished scene, as springs in desert found seem sweet, all brackish though they be. So midst the withered waste of life those tears would flow to me. A meagre breakfast, of claret and soda, with a few mouthfuls of some Italian dish, somewhat restores his natural vivacity and he listens with cynical amusement to fletcher's blood-curdling stories of phantoms who have made the night hideous for the famous old feudal palazzo with its dungeons and secret chambers has been immemorably infested with ghosts and harassed by inexplicable noises fletcher has already begged leave to change his room and then refused to occupy his new room because as his master reports there are more ghosts in there than the other there is one place where people were evidently walled up I am bothered about these spectres, as they say the last occupants were, too. However, he is laughing as he descends the magnificent staircase, the reputed work of Michelangelo, laughing until the shrill querulous cries of peevish children make him stop and frown. He has allowed the Lee Hunts, with their large and fractious family, to occupy for the present the ground floor of the palazzo, and the children are his pet abhorrence. I abominate the sight of them so much, he has already told more that I have always had the greatest respect for the character of Herod. No child figures in any of his poems. His own paternal feeling towards Ada, sole daughter of my house and home, is merely a fluctuating sentiment. He shrugs his shoulders and enters his great salon, again moody and with a downcast air, and throws himself upon a couch in gloomy reverie. Snatches of poetry wander through his thoughts. Poetry intrinsically autobiographical, for the inequalities of his style are those of his career, and his imaginary heroes are endless reproductions of himself, the wandering outlaw of his own dark mind. He has drawn his own picture more effectively in Laura than any strange hand could do. In him, inexplicably mixed, appeared much to be loved and hated, sought and feared, opinion, varying o'er his hidden lot, in praise or railing, ne'er his name forgot. There was in him a vital scorn of all, as if the worst had fallen which could befall, he stood a stranger in this breathing world, an erring spirit from another hurled. His early dreams of good outstripped the truth, and troubled manhood followed baffled youth. His men, in short, as has been observed, are made after his own image, and his women after his own heart. Yet the inveterate family likeness of these heroes is not shown by the heroines of his romantic stanzas, for Byron has an eclectic taste in beauty. One can hardly imagine a wider dissimilarity than between the bride of Abydos, the gentle Zuleika, with her nameless charms unmarked by her alone, the light of love, the purity of grace, the mind, the music breathing from her face, the heart whose softness harmonized the whole, and oh, that I was in itself a soul, and Circassia's daughter, the stately Layla of the Gior, whose black and flowing hair swept the marble where her feet gleamed whiter than the mountain sleet or if the reader seek a further choice there is medora beloved of the corsair medora of the deep blue eye and long fair hair 
or the nameless eastern maiden of the hebrew melodies she walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes thus mellowed that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies one shade the more one ray the less had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress or softly lightens o'er her face where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure how dear their dwelling-place and on that cheek and o'er that brow so soft so calm yet eloquent the smiles that win the tints that glow but tell of days in goodness spent a mind at peace with all below a heart whose love is innocent yet all these heroines are alike in one respect the potentiality of passionate emotion since byron's passions and his powers according to his intense admirer shelley are incomparably greater than those of other men and he has used the last almost recklessly in portrayal of the first as the poet reclines in sombre meditation his reverie is broken by the not unwelcome entrance of his friends who may be better termed his intimate acquaintances for to that brooding introspective spirit constitutionally shy and morbidly conscious of the fact friendship is a propensity he has declared to which my genius is very limited i do not know the male human being except lord clare the friend of my infancy for whom i feel anything that deserves the name all my others are men of the world friendships be that as it may it is with a warmly cordial expression and with that peculiarly sweet smile of his that byron welcomes his usual visitors captain williams captain medwin taff the irishman and percy bysshe shelley the most companionable person under thirty he has avowed that ever i knew when they have discussed the latest little pisan on d and the progress of shelley's boat building the conversation trends more and more toward literary topics personal topics be it understood for byron is not an omnivorous reader like shelley williams and medwin themselves dabblers in verse and prose listen with respectful admiration to the dicta of the great poets exchanging views the low clear harmonious voice of byron is a sort of intoxication men are held by it as under a spell he makes no secret of his open contempt for the professional writing fraternity who will write if he has anything better to do he scornfully inquires i think the mighty stir about scribbling and scribes by themselves and others a sign of effeminacy degeneracy and weakness shelley whose assiduous studies in literature have led him quite to other conclusions defends his craft with ardour but byron's chief successes have been too lightly won he who wrote the corsair in ten days the bride of abydos in four and laura whilst undressing after balls and masquerades cannot be expected to take a very serious view of poetry as the one business of a lifetime i by no means rank poetry or poets says he high in the scale of imagination poetry is the lava of the imagination whose eruption prevents an earthquake if i live ten years longer he adds prophetically you will see that all is not over with me i don't mean in literature for that is nothing and it may seem odd enough to say i don't think it's my vocation but you will see that i shall do something or other this contemner of poesy however is soon persuaded without much difficulty to read aloud some excerpts from his new poems in the process of completion and very well he reads them the listeners are moved to smiles by the bitter humour of the visitation of judgment they are left half breathless by the impetuous vigour of heaven and earth but a murmur of unfeigned applause punctuates the second canto of don juan with its exquisite presentment of youth love and ecstasy in the persons of juan and Aide. it was the cooling hour just when the rounded red sun sinks down behind the azure hill which then seems as if the whole earth bounded it circling all nature hushed and dim and still with the far mountain crescent half surrounded on one side and the deep sea calm and chill upon the other and the rosy sky with one star sparkling through it like an eye and thus they wandered forth and hand in hand over the shining pebbles and the shells glided along the smooth and hardened sand they looked up to the sky whose floating glow spread like a rosy ocean vast and bright they gazed upon the glittering sea below whence the broad moon rose circling into sight they heard the waves splash and the wind so low and saw each other's dark eyes darting light into each other and beholding this their lips drew near and clung into a kiss don juan byron's restless spirit perpetually eager to express itself in action now makes him anxious to dismiss intellectual discussions and he hastily proposes a game of billiards 
as he moves around the billiard table his lameness is distinctly noticeable not all the ingenuity of his tailor nor his own efforts to walk naturally can conceal it yet as has been said of him in other matters he redeems all his defects by his graces and his companions note with surprise the remarkable change for the better which has taken place in him since a few months before he arrived at this old palace on the arno with a troop of servants carriages horses fowls dogs and monkeys the selfish and sensual byron of venetian days is entirely a thing of the past he is improved in every respect says shelley to williams in genius in temper in moral views in health and happiness and although keeping up a certain splendour upon an income of four thousand pounds a year he devotes one thousand pounds of that income entirely to purposes of charity his own personal needs are of the simplest the game concluded byron's carriage is announced his friends and he proceed in it as far as the town gates of pisa by this means to avoid the stares of the streets horses are in readiness at the gates the company with one or two servant men mount and ride into the pine forest that reaches towards the sea byron is as excellent and graceful a rider as a swimmer with remarkable powers of endurance he can cover seventy or eighty miles a day fast going and swim five miles at a stretch he is indeed in many respects the typical open-air englishman but to-day he rides slowly and immersed in thought as his wife years since assured him he is at heart the most melancholy of mankind often when apparently the gayest his abnormally long sight takes in every detail of the scenery storing it up unconsciously for future reference it has been said that byron is nothing without his descriptions and in these he has achieved some of his finest work notably in some of the immortal stanzas of child harold with a dazzling panoramic succession of vivid scenes whether depicting how i stood in venice on the bridge of sighs a palace and a prison on each hand i saw from out the wave her structures rise as from the stroke of the enchanter's wand or on the eve of waterloo there was a sound of revelry by night and belgium's capital had gathered then her beauty and her chivalry and bright the lamps shone o'er fair women and brave men a thousand hearts beat happily and when music arose with its voluptuous swell soft eyes looked love to eyes which spake again and all went merry as a marriage bell but hush hark a deep sound strikes like a rising knell whether again in the vale of vintage the castled crag of drachenfels frowns o'er the wide and winding rhine whose breast of waters broadly swells between the banks which bear the vine and hills all rich with blossom trees and peasant girls with deep blue eyes and hands which offer early flowers walk smiling o'er this paradise or looking backwards through a score of centuries i see before me the gladiator lie he leans upon his hand his manly brow consents to death but conquers agony and his dropped head sinks gradually low and through his side the last drops ebbing slow from the red gash fall heavy one by one like the first of a thunder shower and now the arena swims round him he is gone ere ceased the inhuman shout which hailed the wretch who won byron is emphatically a citizen of the world who has not only painted the environs but reflected the passions and aspirations of every scene which he visualizes and it is this magic power of conveying the authentic impression of an actual occurrence which renders his most recondite situation so thrilling which breathes a western vigour into the scented air of the orient and thrills with poignant pathos through the horrors of the prisoner of chillon a light broke in upon my brain it was the carol of a bird it ceased and then it came again the sweetest song i ever heard and mine was thankful till my eyes ran over with the glad surprise and they that moment could not see i was the mate of misery but then by dull degrees came back my senses to their wonted track i saw the dungeon walls and floor close slowly round me as before i saw the glimmer of the sun creeping as it before had done but through the crevice where it came that bird was perched as fond and tame and tamer than upon the tree a lovely bird with azure wings a song that said a thousand things and seemed to say them all for me i never saw its like before i ne'er shall see its likeness more it seemed to me to want a mate but was not half so desolate and it was come to love me when none lived to love me so again and cheering from my dungeon's brink had brought me back to feel and think i know not if it late were free or broke its cage to perch on mine but knowing so well captivity sweet bird i could not wish for thine or if it were a winged guise a visitant from paradise for heaven forgive that thought the while which made me both weep and smile i sometimes deem that it might be my brother's soul come down to me 
but then at last away it flew and then twas mortal well i knew for he would never thus have flown and left me twice so doubly lone lone as the course within its shroud lone as a solitary cloud a single cloud on a sunny day while all the rest of heaven is clear a frown upon the atmosphere that hath no business to appear when skies are blue and earth is gay the prisoner of chillon unhappily all these shifting scenes of imagination or experience so the poet has made mournful confession have little power to wean him from himself neither the music of the shepherd the crashing of the avalanche nor the torrent the mountain the glacier the forest nor the cloud have for one moment lightened the weight upon my heart nor enabled me to lose my own wretched identity in the majesty and the power and the glory above around and beneath me and although it will be noticed he exempts the sea and although the blood of old sea kings running fiercely in his veins still kindles him to imperishable rapture in its presence and i have loved thee ocean and my joy of youthful sports was on thy breast to be borne like thy bubbles onward from a boy i wantoned on thy breakers they to me were a delight and if the freshening sea made them a terror twas a pleasing fear for i was as it were a child of thee and trusted to thy billows far and near and laid my hand upon thy mane as i do here child herald yet there is sorrow on the sea itself the unplumbed salt estranging sea which separates him from his mother country cosmopolitan as he is self-banished exile quick with greek and italian sympathies byron never for one moment forgets that he is the head of one of england's proudest families despite his scathing scorn towards his fair-weather london friends towards the unreasoning outbursts of malignity which drove him out of his england with all her faults he loves her still he vaguely hopes and hankers after a return to those long-lost shores and endeavours to believe that the future will in some way make atonement for all the calamities of the past but now shelley williams medwin and tafe are dismounting in the pine forest and the men-servants setting up the target pistol practice is byron's forte when he hits a half-crown at twelve yards he is as delighted as a boy and quite glum and disconcerted if he should happen to miss this very rarely happens as he is a crack shot easily distancing the other competitors his hand trembles violently but he calculates on this vibration and depending entirely on his eye hardly ever fails after about an hour's shooting the light begins to wane towards sunset and the friends ride back to the city byron in exuberant good humour with himself and everyone else arrived at the palazzo lanfranchi he finds two guests awaiting him count pietro gamba brother of the lovely contessa giuchioli and trelawney that handsome picturesque piratical-looking younger son who has not yet published to an astonished world his remarkable and almost incredible adventures trelawney is at present in command of byron's yacht the boulevard lying in the harbour of genoa the poet welcomes these new additions to his company for since his arrival in pisa he has begun to entertain men at dinner parties for the first time since leaving england a very cheerful company sits down with him to dinner their host displays himself to great advantage being at once to quote shelley polite and cordial full of social hilarity and the most perfect good humour never diverging into ungraceful merriment and yet keeping up the spirit of liveliness throughout the evening byron according to his own declaration has never passed two hours in mixed society without wishing himself out of it again nobody however could guess at this fact from his bright frank and spontaneous gaiety always an abstemious eater i have fed at times for over two months together he assures his friends on sheer biscuit and water very little food suffices him and besides bien entendu he is anxious to retain that happy slenderness on which he prides himself the slenderness which is a characteristic of his family and which he has recently endangered by a lazy life in venice the guests sit fascinated by his enthralling personality they recognize that he wears a natural greatness which his errors can only half obscure and they rivet their gazes upon that pale and splendid face the only one as scott says that ever came up to an artist's notion of what the lineaments of a poet should be he looks around him upon the ethereal and feminine countenance of shelley the visionary the kind pleasant honest english faces of medwin and williams the good-looking italian gamba the quaint little irishman tafe last not least the dark mustachios and wildly flashing celtic eyes of the cornish adventurer trelawney this latter might well have served for a model of conrad the corsair and so he is assured by his companions sun burnt his cheeks his forehead high and pale 
the sable curls in wild profusion veil his features deepening lines and varying hue at times attracted yet perplexed the view but where they ask shall the original of gulnar be found gulnar who stains her hand with the blood of her lord the pasha to save the corsair from a dreadful death byron refuses to reveal his source of inspiration but shelley quotes with sincere approval the lines which most emphatically delineate the lovely desperate woman embarked the sail unfurled the light breeze blew how much had conrad's memory to review he thought on her afar his lovely bride he turned and saw gulnar the homicide she watched his features till she could not bear their freezing aspect and averted air and that strange fierceness foreign to her eye fell quenched in tears too late to shed or dry but for that deed of darkness where wert thou reproach me but not yet oh spare me now i am not what i seem this fearful night my brain bewildered do not madden quite if i had never loved though less my guilt thou hadst not lived to hate me if thou wilt extreme in love or hate in good or ill the worst of crimes had left her woman still this conrad marked and felt ah could he less hate of that deed but grief for her distress and what she had done no tears could wash away and heaven must punish on its angry day but it was done he knew whate'er her guilt for him that poniard smote that blood was spilt and he was free and she for him had given her all on earth and more than all in heaven the corsair but heaven shelley cries the host what infinite nonsense are you quoting and he hastily turns the current of conversation towards more impersonal subjects the evening wears on the guests depart the clear spring moonlight streams upon the winding arno byron stands dreaming at the open window the bridges and buildings of pisa lie still and silver-lit before him a subtle influence of quietudes steals down upon him from the stars what nothings we are he murmurs before the least of these stars one in particular is it serious entrances his attention with its cold revulgence of pure light his thoughts involuntarily shape themselves in rhythm and rhyme son of the sleepless melancholy star whose tearful beam glows tremulously far that showest the dark thou canst not dispel how like thou art to joy remembered well so gleams the past the light of other days which shines but warms not with its powerless rays a night beam sorrow watcheth to behold distinct but distant clear but oh how cold it is the hour when byron's brain becomes thronged with the glowing phantasmagoria of ideas that cry aloud for visible expression he forgets under the stress of creative impulse the sources and causes of his inherent melancholy the miserable days of his childhood with a fury for a mother the wound never to be healed of his unrequited love for mary chaworth the inimical wife from whom he is eternally alienated the little daughter that he may never hold in his arms the beloved sister separated from his side the ancestral home of his forefathers now pass into a stranger's hold the meteoric glory and total eclipse of his unparalleled popularity in england the follies and worse than follies which have made him what he is consisting in nothing but his passion and his pride these memories like poisonous exhalations are banished from his mind and leave a clear horizon for a while a fertile landscape peopled with great words and images something akin to inspiration seizes upon him and he throws himself to work with all the zest and nerve of his impulsive nature this is a man who writes in his own phrase with rapidity and rarely with pains when i once take a pen in hand i must say what comes uppermost or fling it away not for him that careful polishing of sentences which other writers meticulously bestow i have always written as fast as i could put pen to paper and never revised but in the proofs i can never recast anything i am like the tiger if i miss the first spring I go grumbling back to my jungle and to this impetuous directness of onslaught his finest poems bear witness some critic has remarked that byron is too much of the earth earthy to be a great lyrical writer yet a promethean fire stolen from heaven burns immortally through some of his shorter lyrics in greek it is said there are one thousand six hundred and thirty two ways of expressing the simple fact i love you yet who has ever put it in a more convincing form than byron does in maid of athens Maid of Athens, ere we part, give, oh, give me back my heart. Or since that it has left my breast, keep it now, and take the rest. Hear my vow before I go. Zdoe mu sas agapo. My life, I love you. By those tresses unconfined, 
wooed by each aegean wind by those lids whose jetty fringe kiss thy soft cheeks blooming tinge by those wild eyes like the roe zdoemu sas agapo by that lip i long to taste by that zone encircled waist by all the token flowers that tell what words can never speak so well by love's alternate joy and woe zdoemi sas agapo maid of athens i am gone think of me sweet when alone though i fly to istanbul athens holds my heart and soul can i cease to love thee no zdoemu sas agapo rapidly as his pen flies over the paper the torrent of throbbing thought flows faster still far on into the night when ghostly noises echo through the sleeping palace that ever-gushing and perennial font of natural waters as scott has described the genius of byron pours forth in reckless profusion until at last outspent with energy he draws a deep breath of exhaustion and realizes that he is weariness itself the moon has sunk in arno the stars are halfway across the sky a cold glimmer of dawn is palpitating along the east as byron again to that accustomed couch must creep where joy subsides and sorrow sighs to sleep after a day's fitful fever he sleeps well and rest a few short hours of it is due to that perturbed spirit which now or labored with his being's strife shrinks to that sweet forgetfulness of life that sleep the loveliest since it dreams the least laura End of section four.